because of the fact, like I was telling you about the, the Buckeye Trail and highlighting so much emphasis has been placed on the Miami and Erie Canal, that a lot of people have forgot there were two canals in Baltimore. There was one, the Miami and Erie went from north to south, but the east and the west canal is, is pretty much gone now, it is, and a lot of people don't even talk about it. So uh, I thought, what a, what a neat time to kind of revive the interest since we're talking so much about the Miami and Erie canal, let's talk about the other canal. So I invited uh, Carolyn Smith and Bob Smith the Hoosier uh, Canal Society. So Bob, uh, Carolyn is the editor of the Hoosier Packet, uh, the news journal of the Canal Society of Indiana, a historical group of over 350 members dedicated to preserving Indiana's canal heritage. She's going to do a primary, she's primary research in the lifestyle of canal times. She's a retired teacher, she graduated Indiana State University in St. Francis, and her and her husband, Bob, who was president of this particular group, uh, are, we're active in saving the Grenauer Lock. Everybody remembers maybe a little bit about the Grenauer Lock at the suburb where uh, the bypass goes around Fort Wayne. And uh, I think it caused quite a stir for quite a while because uh, it put, put the kind of, the, 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 what do I want to say, the progress on hold for a little bit until they got all the, the law stuff out of the original law. Uh, and uh, in '91, and now they're at the Indiana State Museum. Uh, so they're recognized authorities on the Indiana Canal area and have our character knowledge with many groups. Uh, Carolyn is also a director of the Maumee Valley Air Reporter, which is where I run into her and Bob originally. Uh, a little bit about the canal at 40, in 1843, the Wabash Canal was opened from Lafayette, Indiana to Toledo, Ohio. And daily the sound of the packet could be heard at the lock. Uh, and going, they went up to us through Antwerp and bringing new excitement and developing our lands in Baldy County. So at this time, I'm going to introduce Bob and Carolyn Smith from Fort Wayne. Thank you. Certainly, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and share with you some insights to the uh, Wabash Area Canal and also the Miami Area Canal and your uh, lovely museum. It's a really a wonderful interpretation, and I hope that we can get more people in the Maumee Valley and Fort Wayne and Toledo and that area uh, to come here and share with uh, share with you the, the beauty of and the restoration that you've done here. Uh, as far as the canals, I think a lot of times uh, we ask people, at least in the Fort Wayne area, what canal is this? They always call it the Erie Canal. Well, it's not the Erie Canal. We learned a couple things today. It's to make sure that we understand that it's the Wabash and Erie Canal, and it's the Miami and Erie Canal. And I'm sure being right here in the center of canal land, you are all aware of that. But, of course, they come together in a town that we've been talking about earlier in the day, at Junction, Ohio. And all that's right here in Pauley County. You have a wonderful canal interpretation because you've got uh, aqueduct sites, you've got reservoirs, you've got culverts, uh, many of the things that uh, a lot of counties don't have are all right here in, in Pauley County. So what I want to do today is, uh, uh, many of you are familiar maybe with the details of uh, here in Pauley County, but I want to talk a little bit about why was there a canal built either one of those canals, why were they built in the first place? At the end of the War of 1812, the nation was wanting to move west across the Alleghenies. There was lots of farmland. Of course, in your area, there was still a black swamp, so that kind of delayed things. But in, in the, the west, there was good farmland, and there wasn't any way to get that produce from the western market to the east. So uh, the War of 1812 delayed the uh, transportation uh, the boom that was going to come. but after the War of 1812, DeWitt Clinton came up with the idea that we ought to have a canal connecting from New York to uh, Lake Erie. Well, his 
it wasn't the only idea. There were also ideas in Virginia. They wanted to collect the, the, the CNO Canal. They wanted that to go from uh, uh, from Maryland all the way up into the Ohio Valley. Um, Pennsylvania also had the idea of building a canal. So there were three different competing uh, plans for canals to, to reach the West. The idea, of course, originally, and today we'd say, well, you know, turn to the federal government, let them build the interstate highway, that'd be a great idea. Well, back then it was different. They didn't turn to the federal government. In fact, they turned to the federal government. The federal government said, no way, that's a state problem. We're not going to work on a canal in upstate New York, when, especially when the Southerners more or less controlled the Congress at that time. That wasn't a good idea. So Stewart Clinton said, okay, we'll go it alone. So in uh, 1817, they broke ground in Rome, New York, at the highest level, at the summit level, for a canal that was going to be some 350 miles that would go from uh, the Hudson River all the way to Buffalo, New York. Well, that canal was well underway in 1825. It was actually completed. That same year, Ohio was coming along with, well, hey, we need to connect up so we can get to Lake Erie so that we can connect with the Erie Canal uh, that's going to New York. DeWitt Clinton came out here to Ohio at uh, the Licking Summit near Columbus on the 4th of July, 1825, and broke ground for the Ohio and Erie Canal, which would be your Eastern Canal. At the same time, he came to a town in southern Ohio, Middletown, Ohio, and broke ground two weeks later for the Miami Canal. Now, it wasn't called the Miami and Erie Canal at that time because it was only going to connect Dayton with Cincinnati about 66 miles of canal. And Middletown was right in the middle of that, so that's why they named Middletown. Indiana, meantime, was off to a much slower start. It had just become a state in 1816. Really didn't have the finances to begin undertaking a canal. But as far back as 1819, Benjamin Stickney, who was the Indian agent in Fort Wayne, had suggested, wrote a letter to Dewey Clinton and said, you know, there's a, only about a seven to 10 mile uh, connection between the Maumee and the Wabash, if we could build a canal in that area, it would extend your canal from all the way from New York all the way down the Mississippi uh, to the Wabash in Ohio and down to the Mississippi to New Orleans. And DeWitt Clinton wrote back, you've extended my whole project a thousand miles. Being a good politician, he thought it was a, an excellent idea. Uh, so he was one of the people that was proponent. Also, George Washington earlier, being a surveyor, was well aware that uh, that, that portage, although he never came out to the side of Fort Wayne, he knew about that connective uh, 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 land uh, connection that we, or water connection that could be made at that point. So he was also was a proponent of the of canals. Uh, so, uh, but the problem he had, what one, it was the land wasn't even owned by the federal government; it was still owned by the Indians. So, in the 1826, there was a quote negotiation with the Indians where well, they met near Wabash called Paradise Springs, and they developed a treaty whereas we gave them some trinkets and some whiskey, and they gave us you know, the land for the canal right of way uh, that would be eventually become the Wabash and Erie Canal. So now basically the federal government had the land, but Indiana didn't have the land, they didn't have the money. So first Indiana went to the federal government again because the Erie Canal had been built, it was, looked like it was going to be a success, it was moving right along, and said, hey, uh, we need, uh, this, uh, we need some money to build a canal. They came originally back in 1824 with a real small grant giving you 90 feet on either side of the canal route. Indiana turned that down. But in 1827, there was something unique that was done. And that was, like the Western Railroad that was going to be used later, the federal government gave land to the state of Indiana, not only in Indiana, but also in Ohio. They made the land grant all the way to the, to the uh, Anglaise River. So well, there's a problem right there. We've got Ohio and Indiana both getting land from the federal government. How are we going to resolve that? But anyhow, they gave alternate sections of land five miles on either side of the canal route. Now they gave the alternate sections to the state of Indiana, who in turn could sell it to individuals who could take the pool of money that they got and build the canal. That was the idea. Now it wasn't really a dumb idea because look, if the canal was built, it was going to become an economic boon to the area and therefore the value of the federal land that was left would be worth maybe twice or even maybe three or four times as much as it was what they gave away. So whoever came up with that idea, I don't know exactly, but that was an excellent idea. They gave alternate sections of land. Indiana turned, well, there's an 1827. 
uh, in uh, uh, March 3rd of 1827 when this land grant was made. And Indiana had five years to build it or they're going to lose it. So, you know, Indiana, you know, they're not moving along too fast, waited until 1832 and about they're running out of time. So finally said, look, we got to do something. So on George Washington's birthday, the anniversary of George Washington's birthday, February 22nd, 1832, they broke ground in Fort Wayne at the summit level, the highest level, which is like 190 feet above Lake Erie, because that's why Fort Wayne's called the Summit City. And that's where they broke ground. Now this is land grant, I want to bring it up because remember we, the Miami Canal was only as far as Dayton. And so I asked them, gee, well, our plans, if they're going to run this canal all the way to Toledo, the Wabash and Erie is going to run to Toledo, we want to extend our canal from Dayton all the way to, uh, to Junction. And so they got in the land grant business too. 1828, they got a land grant, same kind of deal. They got land and sold, sell alternate sections and to help fund this canal. Well, the Wabash and Erie uh, got off to a kind of a slow start in that fact that Ohio was still having problems. So we're going back a little bit, 1832, they broke ground, remember? Well, you think, well, they're going to be building toward the state line and going ahead to Junction and Toledo, because that's where the Eastern Markets, remember the Erie Canal opened in 1825. It's going great guns. They, paid, they already paid off the Erie Canal by the time Indiana had really gotten going. And so the problem was Ohio and Michigan had a problem. If you remember the Ohio and Michigan War, because what happened is the, when they drew the boundaries across when they established the Northwest Territory across from the tip of Lake Michigan, it turned out it was, ended up cutting off Toledo and making Toledo part of Michigan. So they had a problem, and I'm not going into all the details of that. By 1836, Ohio had won, Michigan had lost, because Michigan was a state, Michigan was a territory, they kind of lost, and it was a presidential election, and so what they got, Michigan got, was the western portion of the Upper Peninsula. They already had the eastern portion, but there was a portion of the western portion that they kind of carved off from what would have been Wisconsin, and so Michigan got that. Now they really thought they had gotten taken, but the problem is later on, years later, of course, they discovered iron ore up there, so it wasn't so bad a deal after all. But at least uh, Ohio got Toledo, and so that allowed the Wabash and Erie Canal to proceed, uh, and so uh, it could proceed on to Toledo. But back up a little bit, Indiana started building their canal by going west rather than going east because they knew there was a problem. Ohio was slow uh, in getting, uh, getting their canal built. So they were building from Fort Wayne west toward Lafayette. In fact, it was all the way open to Lafayette in 1840, and it still wasn't connected. This piece that from Antwerp and Paulding County was the old one. And part of it was uh, the politics of the uh, time, but part of it was they're going to you're all aware of the Black Swamp. That was a problem. They had started out in Toledo and they built all the way to Defiance, but this last piece didn't get opened until 1843. So finally in May of 1843, a canal boat called the Albert S. White came all the way through here, was the first boat going through Pauley too, came from Lafayette all the way up to Toledo in May of 1843. In July 4th of that year, they had a huge celebration of 10 to 15,000 people estimated in Fort Wayne to celebrate this canal. So the canal, although uh, today we talk about it being the Miami Air Canal, started out originally, up to Junction at least, was the Wabash and Erie Canal. And it remained that. Now that's about 18 miles of canal that in Pauling County that is really the Wabash and Erie never became part of the Miami and Erie Canal. It was just basically abandoned finally. But we're going to talk a little bit more about how it was abandoned in, in, in just a minute. But it kind of gives you an idea of what some of the politics were. Eventually, like I said, in 1843, the canal was open to, to uh, Toledo. Canal boats began going back and forth. The Wabash and Erie was eventually extended by 1853 all the way down to Evansville, Indiana. So this making it the longest canal ever built in the United States, 468 miles. It's longer than the Miami and Erie Canal. So, uh, the, uh, the going back a little bit to Dayton, the canal been extended to Dayton, and now by in the 1830s it was being extended, but it was again held up by Black Swamp development, getting through the Black Swamp here in Pauley County, and they didn't really reach Junction until 1845. So there was 
really the Wabash and Erie was first, the Miami and Erie was second. And then once that was accomplished, Indiana, you know, hey, what were they running the canal over in Ohio? So they basically turned it over about 1848, I believe it was, and said, hey, Ohio, it's your canal. And at that time, to avoid nomenclature problems, they switched it to the Miami and Erie Canal from Junction on. Another interesting thing about the canal, a lot of people ask, well, how wide is the depth? And you know, it, it's not, the Erie Canal standard it was 40 feet wide, 4 feet deep, blocks 90 feet long, 15 feet wide. That was the standard. But this is good to be kind of interesting, so I'm going to share this fact with you. Fort, Fort, uh, the Wabash and Erie Canal, west of Fort Wayne, 40 feet deep, 4 feet, uh, Four feet wide, four feet deep. Once they got east of Fort Wayne, they knew there was going to be more boat traffic. Okay, they made it 50 feet wide, I mean 60 feet wide, and six feet deep. For Ohio decided they were only going to go 50 feet wide and, and five feet deep. So from the state line over to Junction, it, it narrows down again. The uh, the Miami Erie Canal was built up through this area, 50 feet wide, and five feet deep. But once it got to Junction, they widened it to 60 feet wide. So there's all kind of differences and you know they, it wasn't perhaps coordinated but the thing you got to realize every time you make it's nice to have a wider canal and our travelers will talk about passing on the canal but it takes more water every time you can have a bigger waterway and we that's one of the things you should be aware of this county if there's a water problem wait a minute we're in the middle of a swamp but the problem is everything's all on one level how are you going to get that water elevated enough into the canal so what did they do they built reservoirs they call it the Mercer Reservoir or Grand Lake St. Mary's. It's about 15,000 acres. It's one of the largest man-made uh, lakes, I think, in the world. And uh, then the other reservoir we're going to talk about on the Wabash Neary is the uh, Six Mile Reservoir. And that was about 2,500 uh, acres. Now these canal reservoirs were a problem. It's bad enough living in a swamp, but once you get the swamp kind of drained, you get gut problems with these reservoirs because there was a lot of sickness around them. We couldn't figure out what it was, and today we know what it was. There's malaria, there's that kind of malaria-borne diseases. But back then, they, they, a lot of times they just left trees sitting out in the middle of it. They just flooded. They, these, these reservoirs aren't 15 feet deep, they're only 6 feet deep. And many of you know about Lake, Grand Lake St. Mary's. You always see boaters get toned over, and a storm comes, and somebody gets drowned. Well, it's because it's so shallow. Same problem at Six Mile, uh, the Six Mile Reservoir. That reservoir was fed from the St. Waters from the St. Joe River in Fort Wayne. The water was diverted off the summit west and east. And then in the winter, the excess water was filled into the Six Mile Reservoir, as well as some of the water from Six Mile Creek as well went into the reservoir. And then it would be let out as required to water the canal to the Wabash Area Canal to Toledo. And then the Grand Lake St. Mary was bringing it down this way. There is no feeders in and I'm pretty sure in Pauline County that I know of. But there is some nice aqueducts where they go over the creeks. That's why they had to go over the creeks. They weren't bringing in any water. So the reservoir was a problem at six months. And that was uh, uh, the farmers and the local residents basically uh, decided they were going to solve the problem. So on Jan uh, April 25th, 1887, the canal basically had stopped up to act, operate as transportation, but was now feeding the water into to, uh, the mills at the finance who were using this water. Uh, they just went out there with about 100 pounds of dynamite and they went to Tate's Landing and they filled it. Oh, here we got one up the cover right now. No <laughs> compromise. <laughs> right more must go. One of our reservoirs. <laughs> so they went out there and blew up the, the dam and they, uh, they went to Tate's Landing. Uh, Caroline was talking about Tate's Landing. Another reason to mention that. Big blow up there as well, and the sky was red with dynamite. And, and oh, the smoke governor Forrester uh, said, Send out the National Guard. So by the next day, well, the National Guard's not quite as big back then as it is today. 50 guys showed up, <laughs> but they did have Gatling guns, and they sat out there at night waiting uh, for something to happen. I think there was only one guard because the people in Antwerp got together and said, Look, we gotta, we got to take care of this. So what they did, they got on the train in Antwerp, they got off in Knoxdale, and uh, this is a strange group, stepped in mass, like we saw our reservoir person there, and they had guns. Here they're on this train, and I don't know what the conductor was told, but don't ask questions. The only problem was they, they couldn't identify them except one fellow, a spare warden, had a gold tooth, and they pretty well knew who that was. And I think everybody's kind of winking and nod. They knew who they were. But anyhow, they got off at Knoxdale and went out to the reservoir. And I guess the National Guard was kind of sleeping.
shooting that day. They only had one guard out there. They overcame the guard and blew up the, the, the dam again and blew up some more water. And that was the end of the reservoir and to the chagrin of the people in defiance were too happy about it, but that was the end of the canal in that area. So I hope I gave you a little bit of background about the Wabash Erie Canal. At the end of our program, we're going to uh, uh, open it to questions, so if you have some questions specifically. Uh, we are the Canal Society of Indiana. I say that because on your chairs we've got applications. We are a Canal Society of Indiana. We're not necessarily the Indiana Canal Society. We encourage people to join throughout. In fact, we have people in New York, California, all over that are interested in canals. So since the Wabash Erie Canal goes through your county, I think it would be perfectly natural that many of you might want to become canal members. We do have uh, publications that we have books up here. And one of them covers Paulding County completely, and the other one covers the Toledo area. So it really covers the whole area. Uh, so at this time, what we want to do is kind of step back. What was life really like back in canal time? What was it really like to be a traveler from coming from Toledo? What did they really see when they got to Paulding County? One thing I didn't mention is that the fact that Junction and Carolina didn't mention that. Junction was so important because, wow, why? <coughs> if you sat back today and you didn't know today's history, and you saw this interstate or this waterway coming here and this waterway coming here, Two waterways coming together, gosh, that'd be a good place for a town, wouldn't it? In fact, it was so good that one of the merchants in Fort Wayne, Dana, Columbia, decided to move out of Fort Wayne and move to Junction, Ohio, because that's where the action was going to be. Well, as we know, it didn't turn out that way today. It's you enjoy cars. But uh, we're, we're going to learn a little bit about the black on the canal. So at this point, we're going to go back in time. Thank you. 
notion, you are not going to have any problems at all. Well, I packed my little trunk and I, I went down to the dock and the first thing I found out when I got down there was that there was some pushing and shoving and people trying to get on the boat and um, I was a little concerned, but one of the young stewards came up to me and said, Come, Miss Caroline, never fear, you're going to be fine. Just come with me and I'll get you on board and you'll be all settled and you'll be on your way. Well, I went up to the boat and there um, the um, boat was connected to the dock by a little bitty narrow wooden plank. And that plank was only about 12 inches wide. And I knew I had to cross to get up there onto that boat. Well, I looked at it. You know, the little steward, he just went and put my trunk up on his shoulder, and he just went right up that plank like it was nothing. But being the rather large lady that I am, I was a little bit concerned about that. So I looked at that plank a little bit, and I thought, oh, my. But I got up my courage, and I, I made it, and I was aboard the deck of the boat. Well, when I got on board, there was a little stairway up to the top of the boat, and up on top there were some gentlemen sitting up there. There were some like park benches, and they were sitting up there and reading their newspapers and waiting for the boat to take off. And the young steward said to me, Now, Miss Caroline, you'll probably want to go out if the weather is nice and sit out there, but you know, if it's cool, you'll want to go down below. He said, But when you get up and on deck, you be very, very careful because you see, those men are chewing tobacco. And if they spit, and they miss that spit too, and if you happen to walk all out of there, you're going to off into the canal, and uh, it won't be very pleasant, and it could hurt you. So I took his advice a little bit, and I tried to be a little bit careful for that. But then I said, well, can you show me where I'm going to be uh, in the, the cabin itself? And so we went on down a few steps down into the cabin. And what I came up into was one big long room, about 14 feet wide and about 40 to 50 feet long, that had planks on top of tall horses uh, that was supposed to serve as our dining area where we're going to eat at night. We have all your meals here, uh, breakfast, and your lunchtime, and your evening meal. And he said, uh, This is also where you're going to sleep. Well, now, I was a little concerned about that because when I looked around, uh, I didn't see any place at all where we were going to sleep. And it was one big room, and being a maid lady, I was supposed to sleep in the same room with a bunch of men. Well, the young man said, now, Miss Caroline, never fear. If you notice over here, he says, there's this red and green curtain. And at night, we are going to pull that curtain all across the boat. And the ladies and the children will sleep up in front of the curtain, right behind the captain's cabin, so that the captain can make sure that no one disturbs you. And by the way, lady, you'll even have your own chamber pot. Well, come to find out, on many canal boats, there's only one chamber pot for everyone. So we had our own chamber pot. There was a little table there with a wash basin and a pitcher on it with water in it. And then there was a comb hanging on a string, so we were all ready to go and, and, and get cleaned up. Um, he also said that at night we would be sleeping in berths along the side of the wall. I didn't see any. So he said, oh, tonight we'll come along and we'll put a peg here and here. We'll put a peg here and here. And we'll put a peg down here and here. And between each set of pegs, we're going to hang a piece of canvas. And on top of that, we'll put a little straw mattress. And you're going to sleep up there tonight. Well, I wasn't so sure that I liked that idea at all. But I turned, determined right then and there, if I was sleeping in there, I was going to sleep on the top bunk because if my bunk fell, I'd fall on top of somebody else rather than having somebody else fall on top of me. Okay, then he went and took me into the captain's cabin. And inside the captain's cabin, there was a little pot belly stove sitting on some bricks. And this is where the cook was going to prepare our meals. And these bricks then had a place where you could put a spider and a, a pot, and you can put some of the coal underneath, and you can bake your biscuits and things uh, on this stuff uh, in the Dutch oven down below, and the coffee pot was already going up on top of it. And the steward told me now in the summertime, when it gets really warm outside, oftentimes they put 
the stove outside up on the top deck and the cook cooks out there so we don't get the boat so hot on the inside. Then in the back was a long cabin where we were going to sleep was another smaller cabin and this is where the crew would sleep. And the crew had six hour shifts, six hours off and six hours on. And so did most of the animals. Now, this was a packet boat. So our boat was going to be going uh, day and night. Because you see, packet boats carry packets of mail. And you know the motto, the mail must go through. So it went day and night. Now, if I was riding on a freight boat, or a boat that was half freight and passengers, we would have stopped for it at night time. But our boat was going to go straight through to carry the mail. It was on its way to Fort Wayne from Toledo. So we go through junctions where I was going to get off. Well, I said, okay, so I've seen the crew quarters, and I've seen the interior cabin and all, so it's time for me to go up on deck because it was just about time for the canal boat to leave. The young man was very nice. He had put my trunk for me up, up on deck, and he said later on he would get it for me. And, and when it was time to go to bed, you know, I get a change. I thought, nah, I don't think I'm going to change. It's all nothing more between me and the the uh, gentleman is this red curtain, you know, and I think I'll just uh, loosen up my corset a bit, and, and uh, I'm not getting down to my small with no men on the other side of that curtain. So anyhow, I was all set, and I went up on top of the boat. Now, I'm on top of the boat, in the sunshine, uh, it comes over the window. So I took off my cape, uh, and um, was very careful where I stepped, and uh, I walked along, and the men were there talking, and some of them were talking about uh, the war in Mexico and Zachary Taylor and they were so often they spit. Then there were some ladies with their parasols and um, they were out uh, enjoying the sun. So I had carried out my parasol with me and um, bring my parasol. Anyway, uh, I sat out there in the sun and, and um, uh, a lot of the time it was ready for the, uh, the canal boat to take off. I went up to talk to uh, the captain. And I said, Captain, can you tell me what's happening here? And he said, Oh, yes, Miss Caroline. He said, You watch up there on the tow path. You see where the tow path? He said, That boy up there, the front, he's called the hoggy. Now, he's the one who's going to drive the horses. And he said, By the way, you see, we have horses. And whereas the freight boats are being pulled by mules. He says, But we have horses up there. And our hoggy, when I give him the signal by blowing the horn, he's going to whip up those horses. Well, sure enough, it was time to go. The captain looked at his pocket watch, and sure enough, it was time to go. So he blew his horn, gave a signal to the hoggy, and the hoggy went, yee -ya! And he hit his switch on the back of those horses. Now, the horses weren't like the horses pulling uh, a wagon or a sleigh. They were walking side by side, and on the canal, you know, they walk in tandem, one behind each other. So he flicks the whip at that first horse, the lead horse, and he says, giddy up, and the horses start. They take a few steps, and the boat gives a lurch, and we start moving. And then he says, whoa. And the boat keeps coming, but the horses stop. Then he goes, giddy up again, and he whips them up, and they take a few more steps, and he says, whoa. And they stop, but the boat keeps coming a little bit faster. And then he said, get up the third time, and we were on our way toward Fort Wayne. Does anyone know why he did this? Why did he stop those horses? Well, I had that question, so I asked the captain, and he said, now, Miss Caroline, you think about it. Every time those horses take a step forward, that's putting a lot of pressure right on their chest, and so I they give a jerk, and the boat picks up a little speed each time. It's gliding. If we were pulling it on land, he said, Miss Caroline, we couldn't do that. But since we are on the water, it keeps picking up and picking up and picking up. And once it gets into a better uh, momentum, then the boat can be pulled around together easily. And so the hoggy was being very kind to his horses and treating them like they should be. Well, further along the line, I saw some horses where the canal captains were not as nice to their horses and they were poor, sad, sway back nags that weren't fed properly and weren't changed often enough. 
Well, we were on our way. As the boat took off, the tow line pulled out of the water. And when I looked up in front of the boat, I saw little drips of water coming down and making tiny ripples in the canal in the front of the boat. I turned around and looked at the back of the boat, and there was a wake coming out, going into the banks at the back of the boat. And the captain explained to me that Miss Caroline, when you travel on the canal boat, the boat is only to go four miles an hour, because if we go faster, we make a bigger wake and we'll wash out the canal bank. Okay, he says, now you know that the horses can go much faster than men. And a company who runs the boat and tries to make up for uh, time to make more money can get caught and then they have to pay fines. He says, there's all kinds of rules on this canal here. Besides the going the proper speed limit, you have to know that when we go upstream, and we will go towards Fort Wayne, he said, we are pulling against the current of the canal. The canal is really pretty level, with only about an inch drop every mile. But still, we have a little bit of current, so the boat going upstream has the right away of the boat going downstream. Um, the packet boat, since the mail has to get through, has the right away over the freight boat. The freight boat has the right away over the long raft. Because when you get a mile-long log raft, every time they come to a walk, you have to break it apart in sections, put sections at a time through. The log raft is then rejoined at the other side of the lock before it can proceed on. So sometimes a portion of a log raft goes through, then some boat, and then another portion of the log raft. Well, that felt to me a lot of sense. So I was glad to see that they um, had ways of determining uh, who had the right away and had the rules to follow. And I said, now, do you really enforce these rules? He said, well, we do the best we can. And for example, we know how much um, weight the boat has on it, and we charge accordingly by paying toll. But he said, where we fall short is when we get out here in the little communities, and this person has his own boat, and he doesn't go um, past one of the toll houses. There's toll houses along the uh, canal ever so often, like uh, in Indiana they were at Fort Wayne and at um, Terre Haute, just different places like that you'd have to pay the toll. So he said sometimes the local farmers get away from the government and they, and they don't get the toll that they need to have. Well, we proceeded on and we came to the first lot. Now, uh, have any of you ever gone to a lot? Have you? What was it like? Called a wicket or a butterfly, 
and it can be turned, and when he turned that, a half turn, it opened up so water from the other, upper level came in under our boat. It's just like if you were pouring water into a tub. When you pull it in, it comes up, up, up. And when our boat was high up on the water as the upstream water level, he could then open the gate. Now the captain explained to me that if that water level had been any more than one inch different, it would be so strong he wouldn't have been able to open that gate. Well, the gate was open and we pulled on. And as we go down a little further, we cross all kinds of things. We cross culverts, big places in the canal that we really couldn't see from the boat. It was a place to allow the stream that went under the canal to get through. And I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. There's water. Why can't that water just flow into the canal? Why can't our water from the canal just flow out? And the captain explained to me that, you see, the streams flood in the springtime. They dry up in the summertime. And a canal has to have four feet of water if it's 40 feet wide. If it's 50 feet wide, it has to have five feet of water in order to float the boat. So I guess that makes sense. And he explained to me about these colors. And he said, later on, we're going to come to one where James Durbin, this is in Texas, Indiana, uh, Texas, Ohio, explained and was so proud of his workers who built this cover, he, he actually erected a monument and it stands right beside the canal. And it says, James Durbin, and he's honoring his construction workers' crews for their work on this cover. And he said, Miss Caroline, if you could get out of the boat and go down underneath it, he has built two stone arches, arches that let that creek flow underneath the canal. And he says, now, when they built those arches, they used a frame called false work. And he said they built arches of stone over them, and when they put the key stone in place, it locked the stones together. Then they could move the uh, false work a little further, put another one, and they worked like this until they had a long cover uh, that went the whole width of what the canal would be. And then on top of that, they piled dirt to make the berm and the towpath tie and then they lined them over the top of the stone with puddles, which was mud and straw all tamped down and the possible clay that was tamped down to keep the uh, water in the canal. Well, I was running a lot, and I was getting a little tired. I told the captain that uh, I was going to get going well because the sun was getting a little bit bright. So I went on downstairs, and there I saw the cook who was busily fixing our meal. Now, the cook, she had a flat on her hip. She said it was for medicinal purposes. <clears throat> well, I tell you, our cook was something else. She was six foot tall, bright red hair, freckles, teeth that stuck out every direction. And they said she was so bright that she could serve as a headline like for the canal boat at night. Well, she really wasn't. She was a big, sturdy woman, and she was there. She was fixing our meal for lunch. She was cooking beans. She had salt pork, you see. We had a lot of that on the canal boat. Salt pork, beans, coffee, and it was time to make coffee. So she sent the young boy over to the side of the boat, and he took a bucket of water out of the canal, and he put it in the stove, she began making coffee. And then right after that, he went and took the chamber pot and he emptied it to the canal. <laughs> we really had some good tasting coffee. <laughs> and basically, um, you see, he did empty the chamber pot into the center of the canal. And he did take the water out of the side of the canal. And he did it to the chamber pot after he got water from the cough. But there were also other things along the canal, you see. Um, sometimes along the bank we'd see dead fish or, or maybe a dead deer laying there. And uh, you see, when we were traveling along, especially when we came over here to the Black Swamp area, we could look out and we'd see bears standing along the canal drinking. Sometimes 
and beer. And there's always a lot of stuff dabbling around in the canal and lots of frogs. Now, you see, when you're outside, especially since it's summertime, they say, you get a lot of mosquitoes. But while I was in the boat, in the fall there, we had a lot of black dogs. And at night, when I had to crawl up in my bunk, I spent most of the night talking to trees. Between the black flies and that straw prickling me through that blanket, it wasn't the most comfortable. But you know, how many of you have ever been on a canal boat? Anybody? What's it like? Was it a rough ride? No, we went a big way. You were at Pequa on the um, canal. Okay, well what I found is I came here to Paul in conjunction today, and I came on one of those wagons. It's nothing like a canal boat. You see, a canal boat glides on the water. It's very smooth. The only time that they said that they have trouble is if a storm goes up. And just as we were going through about the fines area, just about the time we were getting ready to get into the slack water, we saw storm clouds brewing in the east. So we locked our boat down into the water there. And uh, um, I guess I'm really kind of ahead of myself here. This was on another day that I went on. But anyway, we locked into the water on the day I was there. and. Uh, we crossed the slack water pool. It was another way when you come to a wide street, if you have to get across, that you are, uh, it's too long to build a bridge or a culvert or an aqueduct, that you put the boat, lower the locks down into the water and go across and come out on the other side to another set of locks. But anyway, the storms of the canal can make the water very, very rough. And sometimes, if a tree gets struck, and it falls into the canal or across the canal, your whole progress is stopped and you can't go any further. So then you have to wait for the state boat crews to come and remove it. Either that or have some of the men on board your boat get out and try to move the tree if it's not too big. So we continued on and eventually we got to this area, you know, of the swamp and um, it was so dark under those trees that it was almost like nighttime out. The canopy of uh, the leaves just covered everything. And they said that this was one of the hardest parts of the canal to dig. Even though if you think you have to go through uh, rocks and uh, glass things out, and by the way, when they didn't have glass and powder when these canals were built, they had to use black powder. They didn't have dynamite right at the first time. And then to dig through the swamp, you dig a shovel of dirt, and the dirt just clings to your shovel. It doesn't fall off. You've got to scrape it off somehow, dig another shovel, and scrape it off. So the captain told me how a lot of the Irish workers got sick and died. Now, the reason that Irish were fairly good at working in those kind of things is because they worked in their peace at home. They were used to wet, uh, soggy weather, so they didn't mind it so much. The Germans who came over to build all uh, more of the uh, structures, like the aqueducts and the culverts um, and the locks, they were finer stonemasons or finer carpenters, but they were ill suited to the swamp weather in particular. Well, I finally got to Junction, and Dana was there to greet me. I spent several days looking around the town. It's beginning to grow. It promises to have a, a great future. There's all kind of grain elevators being built here. It'll be a shipping point uh, for people, the farmers of Pauly and other counties near around to bring in their produce and put it on canal boats. You see, through this area, there's going to be the timber that's being cut over in Indiana, brought through here and taken out to New York to build buildings out in New York. There's so much timber in, in Indiana. And things like canvas hams from Delphi, Indiana, are being sent out east. And, over here, you've got charcoal that we can sell, and, and um, some of your tile and things can be sent by canal boat. So this place promises to be a great city one day. It might someday be bigger than uh, oh, one of those eastern cities, you know, 
canals have a way of doing things like that. So I'm really glad to be here. I've had a good time with Dana, but uh, we came down here today, and uh, he dropped me off. He had to somewhere else he had to go to, but he said, well, you can look around and see if you can find you a husband. So, sir, you look like maybe you had worked on the canal. Uh, were you any chance, uh, um, canal contractor, did you have to build the aqueducts that carried the canal across the stream? You did. Uh, did you did you save your money and buy some land? Yeah, sure. You did. And uh, how many acres did you buy? Well, two. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you grow on two acres? A tree. A tree. <laughs> well, I don't even think that will make a canal boat a little bit longer, do you? <laughs> that will make even a canal boat a little bit longer, do you? That one tree? Well, there's a man over here, and he looks like he was one of those bright, eager fellows who um, probably was constructing. I bet he's Irish, and I, I bet uh, I bet he, he constructed and dug that canal. Uh, is that right? <laughs> See, I knew it. Now, sir, do you like that bottle like most of the Irishmen do? <laughs> I don't. Um, uh, I think I'm going to look further. I, I really don't like someone who is too attached to the box. <laughs> well, sir, sir, I bet you were a canal commissioner. You look like one of those smart men that was out there and helped pass those bills to get this canal done. Is that right? Absolutely. And did you get any land? Well, you know, um, I am looking for someone who has a house with a marble fireplace. You saw in Toledo, I saw them put these beautiful marble fireplaces on board the boat sending out here to the west. Do you have a chance to have one? No. You don't. How many acres of land do you have? Things written about how people would skate from 
city to city. And like Mrs. Gronar of the Gronar Law, she would take a sled, and her husband had a small general store by the law, but that was kind of common, so people might, you know, get something there, um, getting off and on the canal boat. And she would put things on to the sled, and she <laughs> was quite a seamstress and a skater. She'd be all fancied up. She'd be skating down the canal with her sled. She was delivering things on the canal. So the canal uh, closed as far as boat traffic, and that was basically uh, end of December, January, February. Usually it opened up uh, sometime in March. It was a really bad year, maybe not until April. But it was basically operational nine months out of the year. Oh, one other thing is, yes. In some places, they actually had ponds of ice uh, that they had water in and had ice. But other places, they actually cut ice from the canal. And this would be then cut and put in barn type things, wooden buildings that had like double walls and between, in between the walls they would put a lot of straw and they would store the ice there and then in the summertime they put it on the canal boats and ship it up and down the canal to where it was needed and sell it and make a good profit off of it. So it did have that use. Any other questions? Yes, Carolyn. Uh, why would you want to find a husband? Oh, I just got there, and, and, and well, you see, it just it just really has basically opened up, and it was just it was going to be a big and promising town. No, ma'am, I am the Spencer, and I don't know me. And I mean, really, the things that went on the canal all the time, shopping. That one special the fifty cups at the locks, you know, sometimes. Even though there was rules and laws on the canal, those fisticuffs between voters to see whose boat would go through, it kind of uh, appalled me. But you know, having Dana to kind of look out for me and, and having sort of a sponsor, um, I wasn't too frightened. Because there was, you know, a lot of people coming through on these canal boats are, are some pretty fine uh, dandies in Ottawa. Or if I did find a man who was a, a farmer and a uh, steady person. It will, be, it will be fine, you know. It's, it's better than leaving uh, behind, you know. Toledo is so full of belching smoke from their furnaces and everything, and, and the air isn't very really clear like it is out here. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, many of the lock keepers had wives and families, and, and oftentimes um, uh, the lock keeper's children would get, you know, their oldest sons and all would have the responsibility of taking care of the lock. Over in uh, Indiana, Mrs. Gronauer went so far as she planted roses around the lock. I mean, they tried to pick them up, and many times they wanted to, you know, have their lock home. And in Indiana, the locks are numbered to the state line on. So number one is the sailor lock right there at the state line, right across Manforth. And then number two is the Gronar lock, which is right around the Cayman. Uh, but you see, the canalers didn't really call them by them. You know, there's buttermilk lock down around Peru, Indiana, because so those little lock in his daughter go out there and serve buttermilk. So they wanted their, their locks to be known, and, and they were proud of them. Uh, uh, they had flower boxes and things in their windows of their house and things like that. And, and, uh, Oftentimes, uh, they made a lot of money. At, like Bro Joseph Romer, like I said, he had a little general store in his, what was his original home, he made it into a store, then he built a nice home. And uh, the people, when you go through a lot, it would take about 15 minutes. If there was no one else going in, if the water was the right level. If you could go right on into the lot, and it would take about 15 minutes to raise it and get you out and you're on your way. Well, if it was longer than that, then there was a lineup of boats and so People would get off the boat. They go in, and often near the lock you have what we call taverns. But more back then, a tavern was really more of an inn. It also served food and had bedding. Now that bed, you might be expected to sleep through in the bed, and the women may be in a different room because there might be three or four beds in a room for the men uh, at the inn. But there were wayside inns. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, <laughs> why the growing on a lock? Well, uh, a 
think one of the things that gets unique in the it was the timber lock. I don't want to say this is the only timber lock because most of your locks in Pauley County were timber locks. But some of them have been replaced with concrete in the turn of the century, 1900, 1905, somewhere along there. But they're all there. Most of them are still probably buried in the ground there today. The difference was that the groin lock was uncovered. And it was there, and that made it unique. How did they get so deep? How did they get so deep? Well, that was the water. I mean, they, what we were looking at, that's how, that was the level of the canal. They didn't sink down. They were just, actually, that was the level of the canal. And the sediment filled it up. Uh, Highway 24 was uh, filled in and built over the top of it. In fact, some of the grown on lock, about a third of it today is right under the 24 expanded. They left it there. What, what was taken out was, I mean, it would fill this room completely through the ceiling, and that's only maybe an eighth of the timber that was used. And a lot of this timber is not in the ground a lot, but some of these timbers are oak, white oak. Timber today we just love to have, but it's, that's what they use. They were still good and solid. Still good. Actually, they took, we were there when they took the uh, chainsaw, <coughs> cut them off, the lead portion of it, sawdust was flying out just like it was today. Now, about that much is so. The rest of it was timber that big. Actually, no green. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was still, I mean, as long as the timber stay under the water. That's why when Carolyn was talking about going out pinpointing locks, well, you can, you can find them. Down there with a tile throw or something, you'll be able to find them, mark them. Uh, they're there for posterity. Maybe you'll have an archaeological group come out from uh, 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 Bowling Green or someone to do a study on these locks. Maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe down the road. That's what's going to happen. If we can identify them. And, make sure we know where they are. That's one of the things the Canal Society does. We publish information just like you're doing here. We try to bring together this information, like last, bringing the maps, gathering that information together so that we have to collect it. Uh, as, I, as you drive along, how much of the canal has been filled in? Is there anything that for historical purposes, any type of law now that says you cannot fill in a, a canal if it's on the property? Uh, not that I know of. I don't know about Ohio, but Indiana, the, the, the basic difference between Ohio and Indiana. You come into Ohio, you see, oh, Buckeye Trail, wow, wonderful. What happened in Indiana? What are they doing over there? Well, the difference is, it was owned by the state of Ohio. Ohio never turned it over to private. Remember, Indiana got in trouble in 1847. They said, whoa, we're in debt, we can't do it. We're going to give it back to the bondholders. You guys, if you build a canal to Evansville, oh, we'll give you the canal. So they gave them the canal. By 1870s, it was defunct. They couldn't replace the structures. So they sold it off in sections. Here's one guy bought the lot up to the state line. Another guy bought the southern piece. And then that subsequently got divided. It's in private hands. And it makes it very difficult to put Buckeye Trails in Indiana because we're in the process of trying to reacquire that land today. And you know how it is here. This property owner doesn't want to sell. It's like a, 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 you talk about the junction. I mean, there might be a problem. Somebody doesn't want to sell. Somebody doesn't like trails. They think that they're going to have vandalism and all this. You know. But let me tell you, the trails are the thing that's coming. It's when people sit around sit around in front of their uh, televisions, in front of their computers all day long. They need to get out and do something. And that's the trail, the thing that's going to bring this all together. And maybe this is a good time to talk about the Maumee Valley Heritage Card. One of the things it's trying to do is develop trail development, develop history, pride in the, in the, in the valley. We have brochures up here, and we've got one, two, three, at least three of the next four board members that are you know, from this area. And what we're trying to do is get national recognition for this area. This area has more history than many areas that are designated as historic sites. But we're going a little bit further south in this, but I'll give you an example. Fort Recovery, Ohio. More people died in Fort Recovery, Ohio than Custer's last fan, and I, that's a national historic site. We've got Fort Meigs up here. That, uh, it basically saved the Midwest from the British during the War of 1812. William and Henry Harrison hadn't turned the British back at that point. Might have been a completely different history. We've got uh, uh, Tecumseh, we've got Little Turtle, we've got all this history, and that's what we're trying to bring together in, into this valley. It's, it's important that we increase our membership. And you, you, you may not get a lot for out of your membership, you, you know, try to do more publications, but we want you to join the strength in numbers. When people in your congregation see this organization has this many members that are interested in history, that's what preserves it. When they see a structure like this and publicize it, that's what preserves history. That's what the young kids come along today. You know, we all look, we're older. We, we want these younger, these younger people to get involved in canals and in history. I've diverted a little bit. Yeah, sure. Mm, 
I don't know off the top of my head, but I wouldn't say it's a couple hundred people at the man. It really never, never really took off. Never took off because financial problems. Uh, uh, oh, well, the canal was built at the Panic of 1837. When Andrew Jackson said he had to buy land with gold. He couldn't just buy on speculation. Remember, like the internet bubble was kind of burst. But that's what happened with the land back in that time. All the banks started closing and they ran out of money. And the Indiana, a million dollars that they had borrowed that was came to Indiana. And they ran out of problems, so they ran into financial problems. Well, that really put the dam on the canals. And, it, and the Miami area survived until 1920, I think, uh, mid-1924, so 28, somewhere there. They had a, a celebration down in Middletown, Ohio. That, remember I said that's when the groundbreaking took place? The final event in 1926, 27, somewhere in there, was in, my, it was in Middletown, Ohio, for the Miami and Erie Canal. That's when it was officially closed. They had a band and parade. Uh, he was saying that we need to join the corridor. We also want to encourage you to join the Canal Society of Indiana because uh, we cover all the canals. I do quite a bit of writing about the Ohio Canal, too. I publish a monthly journal. They, uh, it's our news and journal. It runs from 16 to 28 pages. This is the past few months. Uh, I'm spread those out over months. Uh, this is the way it's, it's going to tell you about your canals over here. Uh, our membership is $25 a year, and where he was saying that the corridor itself doesn't publish much, the Canal Society of Indiana publishes a lot. Now, our thing about the canal is also about the trail uh, uh, and what's going on in that. We I cover Ohio, too. Oh, I said, yeah, we, co we cover Ohio and those things, too. So we really like to encourage you to join both of the organizations. Are there any more questions? Okay, I certainly want to thank you. Yeah, you have a question. What? We hear all the time about we're talking about skating on the canal, but at the same time, if they have to do repairs or fix something, the canal doesn't have water. So, well, whenever you close every winter, is the water leaves the canal. No, they would just close off the sections. You could see a lock every time you have a lock or a dam. You could stop it off. So you would just water the section that you're repairing. You wouldn't have the whole thing done at one time. It wouldn't be done every year. And it wouldn't be done every year. Uh, uh, like about the first seven years after it was built, they didn't have to do anything. And then, uh, like with the timber lock, the repairs and stuff like that had to be above the water line. Anything that's below water is preserved. And to your question about lock, there's a lot of wood down in there as long as it's in the water table. It's what's rotted away is what's above the water table. Oh, there's so much water over here. You probably have acres worth of timber down there. Okay. Thank you very much for having us, and I hope you've joined both organizations. We want to thank both of Bob and Carolyn for showing up today. We appreciate your time. Like I said, we, we have a great time. Uh, Uh, yeah, please stick around and visit with us. Uh,